the Crooked Table Podcast. You'll never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. Here's to 40 years, Star Wars. Welcome to the Crooked Table Podcast, where we discuss the world of film from a fresh angle. And now your host, Robert Yanis Jr. Welcome to the Crooked Table Podcast. This is Rob. On this episode, it's Star Wars, nothing but Star Wars. That's right, we're going to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the Star Wars saga with my own personal discussion of what the franchise means to me. Uh, I've actually spoken about it several times on here, but I've never really delved into a broad array of topics on the galaxy far, far away. Also, some of you may be wondering what my thoughts are of that other long-running sci-fi franchise. No, not that one. No, not that one either. I'm talking, of course, about Alien, with the sixth entry in the series proper, Alien Covenant, now in theaters. Uh, you may be wondering, you know, what my where, where I weigh in on that. Am I uh, on one side of the Prometheus fence or the other, uh, in short, basically? And where does Alien Covenant land uh, with the predecessor directly, you know, the, the Ridley Scott film from 2012 that... Basically divided moviegoers pretty uh, pretty evenly, I'd say. There's a lot of people that actually really love Prometheus, and a lot of people that think it's dog shit. And, um, you know, you might be wondering what I think about that. So stay tuned for more on that and where you can hear my thoughts about that in the near future. For now, let's make the jump to hyperspace for my full-on dive into the world of Star Wars. 20th Century Fox presents the most extraordinary motion picture of all time, Star Wars. Here's where the fun begins. No legendary adventure of the past could be as exciting as this romance of the future. Here they come. May the Force be with you in Star Wars. You hear hyperbolic claims all the time in marketing, but I gotta say, the most extraordinary motion picture of all time... That's pretty on the mark when you're talking about Star Wars. I mean, the pop cultural impact that this saga has had is is pretty pretty much unmatched in the world of cinema or the world of culture at large on a global scale. And um, that was actually a clip from one of the initial trailers for the 1977 release of Star Wars, the George Lucas epic. So let's take a little bit of a trip back in time. May 25th, 1977. George Lucas created a sci-fi fantasy hybrid inspired by The Flash Gordon and other adventure serials he grew up with. Much has been said about how George Lucas combined these otherworldly elements and pulpy tone with samurai philosophy in Joseph Campbell's classic hero's journey. Of course, that original film, now commonly known as Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope, kicked off one of the most successful film series of all time, both financially and as far as pop cultural impact, as I was just saying. Um, spawning countless TV shows, books, comics, merchandise galore, anything you can think of, there's a Star Wars version of it. The film has inspired generations of storytellers since then and cemented the summer movie season as a go-to destination for a blockbuster spectacle. Oftentimes it's sort of linked with 1975's Jaws, uh, from Lucas's, of course, Lucas's buddy Steven Spielberg. Um, but Star Wars is the one that really kind of, I think, nailed that point home as far as the summer movie season. Not to mention, Lucas's retention of merchandising rights ultimately made him a billionaire, and fans' love for the saga hasn't always been that rosy, unfortunately. Because the divisive prequels and Lucas's tinkering with the original versions of the initial trilogy, beginning with the 1997 special editions, has earned the ire of many passionate fans. But with Disney's 2012 doc- 2012 acquisition of Lucasfilm for $4 billion, no less, and the reintroduction of the saga on the big screen with 2015's The Force Awakens, and has reinvigorated mainstream interest and respect for the franchise. Last year's Rogue One, of course, see the show notes for my in-depth thoughts on both The Force Awakens and Rogue One, only perpetuated that return as the first standalone Star Wars film. Now with Episode Eight, The Last Jedi, hitting theaters later this year, a Han Solo prequel for 2018, Star Wars appears to be here to stay with a steady stream of content for years to come. So that's a little bit of a history lesson on Star Wars and how it started. As for me, how I got into the franchise. All right, well... I actually wasn't as as passionate and uh, uh, as I am about Star Wars now. I actually wasn't that big into Star Wars growing up. I wasn't really exposed to it very much. 
um, aside from, you know, in like, you know, a school setting, just kind of or like a daycare, just kind of hanging out and they put on the Star Wars movies. But for a long time, I didn't even know which order the films went in. I kept getting confused if it was Return of the Jedi and then Empire Strikes Back or, of course, the other way around, which it is. And um, I didn't really get into Star Wars until I was a teenager, actually, um, with the 1997 releases of um, A New Hope, Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi in January, February and March of that year, um, sort of, I guess, teeing up Lucas's prequel trilogy that he was already working on. Uh, at that point, sort of filming, I think they, I think Phantom Menace filmed in 1997. Um, that was when, that was more really my first big introduction to Star Wars. In fact, I remember, I remember right before, like when we heard that the movies were coming out on the big screen, I think we went to the video store and we rented the old VHS copies. Um, I don't even know if it was the 1995 home video release. I think it was the one before that. Because I remember the really, really old style boxes on them. Um, so we picked up the trilogy and we watched them at home. And that's when I was like, holy shit, these movies are awesome. Where have I, where have they been my whole life? So, because I didn't really have any Star Wars toys growing up. I didn't dress up as any of the Star Wars characters for Halloween. I, uh, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't, I, I just wasn't into it. I just, something that wasn't really exposed to. I barely knew anything about the Star Wars saga at that point. But when the special editions came out. I saw all three of them on the big screen, and I loved them to death. Um, that was when my brother, Freddie, who, of course, you guys have heard many times on this podcast, um, he was he was more in the age group for, you know, he was, like, I think, in elementary school at that point, like midway through elementary school. And he was getting the toys, and I was playing the toys with him, and we were getting the video games and that kind of stuff. So that was really my experience with it, was the special editions. I know a lot of people like to shit on the special editions and all the, the ways that it's, it ruined my childhood and all of that. Uh, but the special editions really are what brought me into Star Wars in a big way. And I'm sure that's the same for a lot of people that either missed the boat on Star Wars in their, their early part of their childhood or that coming generation like Freddy and like other people who are now in their early 20s who were just little kids when the special editions um, hit theaters. And of course, I remember them making a crap ton of money. I think A New Hope made something like $130 million, which was a lot back then. Now it's not Now it's not so much. Now you hear all the time about movies making two or $300 million and flopping. But $130 million on a movie that was, at that point, 20 years old and hadn't, uh, you know, with, with a little bit of, you know, some tinkered footage and some couple scenes added, that kind of thing. But it, it was, I mean, there was no production cost, really, for 20th Century Fox to do that. I mean, a few million maybe to to uh, restore the, the uh, prints, that kind of thing. It, it's not like they made an entirely new film. And it made a pretty significant amount of money for what it was at the time. Um, so, of course, that was the special editions they brought me in. And I was one of those people, like many, who in high school saw The Phantom Menace, and uh, and was convinced it was a good movie for a while. I think I even saw it two or three times in theaters. And uh, it wasn't until much later that that backlash started to set in. Same thing with Attack of the Clones. Uh, I saw that a couple, a few times in theaters. I think one that's in IMAX as well. And Revenge of the Sith. So the prequels, the special editions and the prequels were really what fueled my love of Star Wars early on. And then since then, it's sort of been self-sustaining. Um... I kind of went in stasis for a while, uh, but it was pretty ingrained in me during my teen years and my you know early 20s with um, the release of the special editions and then the prequels, of course. It's funny because Kai was actually sort of surprised when, uh, when uh, Force Awakens was announced that all of a sudden I was like, oh my god, Star Wars, I'm so excited! Because I guess I would mentioned to her that I like Star Wars, but like I said, it was during that sort of uh, hiatus for the franchise. Uh, at least on the big screen, that it wasn't it wasn't something that was so obvious. And I remember her saying something along the lines of like, "Holy crap! I didn't realize you like Star Wars so much." I'm like, "Well, yeah, there just hasn't been very much new uh, new content." I mean, I, yeah, I know there was content, but there uh, me being a movie guy, it's the films that really really get me uh, charged up about a franchise. So there hadn't really been anything out there major for me to uh, for me to sink my teeth into since Revenge of the Sith and. Um, you know, during those early uh, early 2000s, late 90s, that really became my de facto favorite film franchise with really only the Batman films um, to compete with. And I'm talking about Batman films as a whole, not any specific subset of that. 
So <clears throat> weighing in on a couple of things, of course, now that I've laid out my personal experience of getting into Star Wars, you might be wondering where I stand on a few controversial topics. So I wanted to run through some of those. Number one, Ewoks. I hate the Ewoks. <laughs> I don't know if, if it's uh, if it's like How I Met Your Mother um, s- sort of posited at one point that there's a cutoff where if you were a certain age when they, maybe you were if you were a kid when you saw the Ewoks, then you were like, oh my God, this those little teddy bears are adorable. Or if you if you were introduced maybe to Star Wars at a slightly older age, as I was in my mid-teens, um, which I guess is old enough to be like those teddy bear things are annoying. Um, <laughs> But I, I can't stand the Ewoks. I think, yeah, they're cute in a couple moments in there. But I think uh, as one film review I read back in the day about... Uh, what, what film was What was it? I think it was one of the prequels. They were saying about how the Ewoks and Return of the Jedi sort of set into motion a sort of fixation with cuteness and kids' uh, entertainment that Star Wars sort of got stuck in until kind of Revenge of the Sith, which really went to dark places. And now... With the Force Awakens, I'm looking at my Force Awakens poster in in the Rob Cave right now. Um, the Force Awakens and some of the new films sort of found that balance where it's dark, but it's also fun, and they, and they have nailed that tone a little better. Uh, the middle section of Return of the Jedi, because basically you can break that down into three distinct acts. There's the Jabba uh, Jabba's palace attack and escape. There's the whole Ewoks and mission to Endor, and then of course there's the attack on the on the uh, the second Death Star and Luke's confrontation with Vader and the Emperor. That midsection, I think, to me, is a big reason why that film is not as high up on my uh, ranking of the films, and I'll get to that in a little bit, as as it should be, considering it's part of the original trilogy. I think Return of the Jedi set a standard for weak trilogy cappers that we've seen pretty much almost every, almost every big film trilogy um, has... A pretty disappointing third one. I mean, I'm thinking The Dark Knight Rises, clearly the weakest of that. Godfather Part 3. Uh, I'm thinking, man, I was just thinking one. Another. Back to the Future Part 3. I love Back to the Future 1 and 2, 3, and it's okay. Um, with, the, with ironically, one of the only exceptions being Revenge of the Sith. And I think the Ewoks sort of the, bring down the middle act of that movie. I mean, this is the Star this is galaxy wide stakes and we have enough time to sit down and listen to story and 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 3po to um to basically you know this whole gag of him being a god that was just i I could have done without a lot of that and uh and i think the ewoks are a bane on the return on the on the star wars canon and i really hope that we never go back to them again and i think that enough people have sort of uh, spoken out about the Ewoks that you'll never you'll probably never see an Ewok or a Gungan on the on the big screen ever again. As far as the expanded universe, my exposure to that, I've seen about maybe a couple seasons of Clone Wars. I did see the the film, the Star Wars Clone Wars film in theaters and um, that that's it's good, it's fine. It's 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 not the same quality as the live action films. Unfortunately, uh, most of the live action films, we'll get into that in a second. And I've been keeping up with Rebels, sort of. I've been watching because I don't have cable and uh, I don't really have any access to, uh, to seeing the new episodes as they're, as they're airing on Disney XD. I have basically been checking them out when they've come on DVD. So I've seen the first two seasons. The season that just ended, I uh, still haven't seen so because I don't think it's out on uh, DVD or anything yet. Or, uh, you know, streaming or anything like that. So, uh, I'm a little behind on Rebels and I'm way behind on Clone Wars. I actually do think that Rebels strikes a better tone, uh, a closer tone to the films as a whole. And I'm really enjoying where they're taking the storyline and the new characters there. And and the the integration of Ahsoka Tano and uh, characters like General Thrawn, uh, Admiral Thrawn, sorry. Admiral Thrawn and, and catching up with Vader and all that stuff. And um, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing more of that, and I know that they just they just got announced that this upcoming season is going to be their last. So um, I'm definitely going to keep tabs on that, especially since Clone Wars and Rebels have been established as part of the canon, uh, unlike pretty much everything in the expanded universe prior to the Disney acquisition. And we'll get there in a second. As far as novels and comics and games, I've read a couple comics. Um, there's like uh, I think I don't remember Star Wars Infinities, I think it's called where it's sort of an alternate 
take on uh, Empire, and Luke passed away in, I think, the Battle of Hoth, and uh, Leia actually goes to get trained as a Jedi, and I thought that was interesting. Um, as far as novels, I've read a couple, but I've never been hardcore into that. I've read the novelization of the prequels, as well as Tales from Jabba's Palace, and of course Shadows of the Empire. I had to read that, because that was essentially a sort of quasi-standalone story in novel form, and I still think that they should get around to adapting that either into an animated film or a series or um, something for Netflix. I don't, I don't know how they would do it, but uh, but I would love to see that. And as far as the games, I played a few here and there, but the ones I remember the most were the Super Star Wars uh, and its sequels for the Super Nintendo. Those were really fun. And like I said, Special Editions what got me into Star Wars in the first place, and those games sort of uh, kind of capitalized on the repopularization of the saga right in the in the um, you know in the late 90s as far as the prequels where do i stand on the prequels oh, that question that all star wars fans uh pose to one another i guess uh i um i i mostly enjoy the prequels um episode one is a mess and it kind of hurts me a little bit every time i watch it but you know, there's still things to enjoy in there. There's still Darth Maul. There's still, um, there's still the seeds of a, of a better story to come. As far as episode one, I really view that as it's kind of the prologue to the main story because we do have the biggest time jump uh, in the prequels between episodes one and two. And I don't feel like the main thrust of the Empire, the, the Death Star, the Rebellion, and all that stuff even gets into motion until Episode 2, where the whole Clone Wars and Palpatine's Ascension uh, and all that takes place. Episode 2, I know a lot of people actually hate more than Episode 1, which, I mean, I guess the, you know, the whole Anakin Padme thing, I don't like sand. It's rough and coarse and irritating, and it gets everywhere, and I understand that. Because that's annoying as shit. I mean, if you had to get if you that scene and the in uh, the one where they're rolling around in the grass, and then the uh, the <laughs> the uh, discussion of their relationship by fireside, I'm I'm haunted by the kiss you should never have given me. Jesus Christ, Lucas, seriously. Um, <laughs> I understand that, and I understand why some people would would kind of use that to fuel their hatred for Attack of the Clones and Hayden Christensen in particular. Um, but I, I still, you know, those scenes aside, those are pretty terrible. I like uh, I like Yoda finally stepping up and battling. We get a, a better sense of why he's such a badass. I like the sort of Obi-Wan detective story that anchors the second half of the film. That whole uh, climactic act three arena scene and the battle with the Jedi on Geonosis, all that, the beginning of the Clone Wars, and the interplay between uh, Anakin and Obi-Wan and, and Padme, and then later the confrontation with Dooku, all of that I really liked a lot. And I think that that film largely is lar it's largely pretty enjoyable. It's not the best, but it's clearly not the worst. And as far as Revenge of the Sith, I love Revenge of the Sith. I think Revenge of the Sith is one of the best and probably the most underrated of the films, I think because of episodes one and two, it gets bulked in uh, bulked in there un, uh, unnecessarily. Yeah, there's some of the same stuff that I just mentioned about episode two that people, people hate it so much, but there's barely any Jar Jar Binks. There's like one line he has in a crowd shot from far away saying, excuse me. So that does, you don't have that to complain about. And Hayden Christensen's, yes, his acting is still wooden, but at a certain point he... Spoilers, goes to the dark side, and he's supposed to be sort of emotionally shut off, and I think it actually works in uh, in some most of episode three later on, especially. There are stupid things like my least favorite scene, which is Padme and Anakin on the balcony, and um, she, he's like, you're so beautiful, and she's like, it's only because I'm so in love, and they're going back and forth about, love has blinded you? That fucking makes me hurl. I hate that scene so much. And uh, I really wish they would have taken it out. But for the most part, the political overtones, the uh, the sort of epic scale of Revenge of the Sith, and finally the big, big reveal that we all knew about, really, but the characters didn't, that Palpatine is in fact Darth Sidious. All of that is really, you can feel the prequel trilogy come to a head. And um, I read somewhere that 
60% or so of the backstory for the original trilogy that Lucas had in his notes is in Revenge of the Sith, which means that other 40 is split between episodes 1 and 2 and then filled in with crap, uh, like taxation routes and shit like that, and, uh, you know, uh, trade federations and stuff like that. So it really starts to... It really kind of solidifies in my mind why Revenge of the Sith is so strong because that's the story Lucas was just... That's the really the story he wanted to tell. And episodes one and two were just a way to get there and to sort of flesh it out a little bit more. So I love Revenge of the Sith. We'll get to that in a little bit. As far as the special editions and the changes that he's made, um, with, rare, with rare exception, I don't mind most of them. The As far as, like, as, far as sort of CG enhancements, like... Uh, the view of uh, Cloud City on the, the exterior of Cloud City when they're approaching, or um, the approach to Mos Eisley in A New Hope, or, uh, you know, kind of tinkering with the Wampa scene in Empire Strikes Back. Um, those kinds of things don't bother me. I will say that the Job of the Hut scene in A New Hope that they added is kind of ridiculous and superfluous and didn't really need to be there. It still doesn't. And the CG, no matter how many times they fix it, it still looks terrible with Job of the Hut. I think the whole Greedo shooting first thing is freaking ridiculous, and I wish that they would just leave it alone. But a lot of the other changes I don't mind as much, especially since this is one of the only exceptions I will say for this, is because they're telling prequel stories that are super CG, it kind of looks ridiculous if you're watching these movies in order, and I know a lot of purists will want to avoid the prequels entirely and just focus 100% on the original trilogy and pretend like the prequels don't exist. But I think... If you're watching it episodes one through six, as a lot of a lot of audiences probably are now, I think it would be kind of ludicrous to go from Revenge of the Sith, where Palpatine is throwing the Senate at Yoda, and uh, Anakin and Obi Wan are fighting on Mustafar with basically a live volcano everywhere, uh, and then go to A New Hope, where there's none of that, and the only lightsaber battle is to like middle-aged guys awkwardly it's kind of bumbling back and forth and uh i think i think obi-wan gets like one really good spin in there or something but you're going from revenge of the sith which is ludicrously over the top to something essentially very limited and very grounded and i think that that having some of that cg in there sort of helps to may smooth that transition a little bit i will true confession i even don't mind the um, some of the musical changes. I know a lot of people hate Jedi Rocks in Return of the Jedi, but I'm an apologist for it. I think uh, it's kind of funny. And again, this is unbiased because I grew up more with the special editions than with the original versions of the film. I have seen the original versions of the films, of course. Um, I That's sort of what I'm used to, too, at a certain point. And I could see that's why some people are like, well, why don't... Why don't they just release the original versions and then I don't have to be so pissed about this other one. But as it stands, if you're really, if you're closely tied to the original versions, you don't have that option. And I do agree. I think they should release those. I think um, not having those out there is sort of doing a disservice to the massive fan community. And, um, you know, kind of force feeding you a... a a version of the film that that it is does not ring true to what you saw when you were eight years old in the movie theater, what you grew up with, and I understand wanting to share that version of the film with your children and grandchildren and that kind of thing as time goes on. So, uh, but most of the changes don't bother me. I actually think um, some of it makes some of it actually makes sense. I think adding Ian McDiarmid into Empire Strikes Back um, and giving him sort of updated dialogue to sign up, sort of fine tune the exact nature of what the dynamic is with the Emperor and Darth Vader at that point. Uh, I think that works. And I think some of the ones that the, the, the Tamora Morrison doing the voice of Boba Fett fits because we know that he's a clone of Jango Fett. We've seen this. And, and I like those little continuity um, uh, attempts at maintaining that continuity, at least. I will say, though, that I do not like the Hayden Christensen ghost at the end of Return of the Jedi. I think that's kind of ridiculous and doesn't really make sense. However, if reports or rumors that I'm hearing that The Last Jedi is going to have Hayden Christensen sh sort of show up as Anakin's ghost to Kylo Ren, then I feel like Return of the Jedi basically planted that seed for that to be a possibility. And maybe that's why they made the change, just in case, oh, if, they ever, if we ever make another movie, we don't have to 
digitally recreate Sebastian Shaw. We have we have Hayden Christensen alive and well and kicking, who can still play Anakin, uh, at least in Force Ghost format. As far as Disney's role in this franchise, I think there is a little bit of uh, a risk of Star Wars fatigue. Um, it's hard to it's weird to say that since I love the franchise so much, but the fact that they're now churning out a film a year. I think after a while that can get that can make people kind of tired of it. Um, but then again, Marvel Studios is putting out two or three movies a year, probably three movies a year now. I think pretty much three or four, and people are are enjoying the hell out of it. So I mean, as long as Disney can keep the quality up, um, I'm kind of okay with these regular releases. I do think that at some point they might want to take a pause on on uh, certain elements of the franchise. For example, I think if they're going to do alternating Episode 7, Rogue One, Episode 8, Han Solo, Episode 9, and then another standalone, I think maybe skip a year or so, uh, a skip a year or two, maybe without either without any Star Wars or at least without kicking off another trilogy just to give people some breathing room. Um, there's already been talk that they're planning another trilogy beyond Episode 9, now whether that's Episodes 10, 11, and 12, or, uh, you know, an Obi-Wan trilogy, or... Um, or the Knights of the Old Republic. I know a lot of people want to see a film trilogy of that, and I'd actually been at, be down with that. You don't have to give it an episode one, two, or three type of uh, delineation. You can just sort of roll that out as the prequels to the prequels in a way, because they've talked about how the Sith have been ex extinct for millennia. Let's see that. Let's see the Sith. Let's see a crap ton of Sith and a crap ton of Jedi. We have not seen that at all yet. It's always been a couple Sith versus entire like Jedi Order. Um, so I'd be down with that. And I think that um, Disney acquiring Star Wars was a, a brilliant business move. I mean, they spent $4 billion on that. And I guarantee you with The Force Awakens and Rogue One, I mean, theatrical, theatrically, they probably made that back with both of those films. But they probably made that $4 billion back just on The Force Awakens when you count in box office grosses across the world. Home video, um, well, I know it's home video, I know it's not video, but Blu-ray and DVD and digital sales, whatever. That sounds too, that's too cumbersome. Home video, okay? Fuck it. It's video, you all have it at home. It doesn't matter what format it's on. Um, and merchandising and all that stuff, I'm, I'm sure they made that back instantly. Because, I mean, this is Star Wars we're talking about. And if they're trying to get the, uh, you know, boys to get into their stuff, I know they have print, they have the princess, thing, and I know this is not... Me being sexist, this is Disney being sexist. This is the industry, Disney viewing, well, we have a princess line for the, to get little girls to buy our stuff and to go see our movies. We have Frozen and all that stuff. And then we need to get we need to get little boys to go watch our stuff and buy toys and action figures and whatever. So we need to get Marvel and we need to get Star Wars. And I, I think that's very short-sighted, uh, antiquated way of thinking. Uh, I have a little daughter now, as you guys know. And I'm just, I already kind of introduced her to Star Wars a little bit. Um, and uh, I plan on introducing her to Marvel so and Disney princesses. So I think that's, that whole notion is ridiculous. But from a business standpoint, if that's the way they see it, regardless if you divide it by gender or whatever, um, Star Wars is it doesn't get more mass appeal than Star Wars. It's one of those franchises that pretty much everyone knows, pretty much everyone's seen. And most people at least like it, if not love it completely. I mean, there's the hardcore fans like me and like people that are even more ardent than I am. And then there's people who are like, oh, casually, like, yeah, I'll go see it with some friends, whatever. Um, but Star Wars is such a presence in pop culture that did, it, it seems like a match made in heaven. And considering that Disney has had that Star Tours ride since the early 90s, it sort of feels like something that the Disney company has been kind of easing up to at some point kind of cozying up to Lo uh, Lucas and um, I, th I think I almost said Logan I'm thinking about the Wolverine movie comes on blu-ray on May 23rd and uh, check out my podcast episode where I talk about Logan uh, by the way it's a shameless plug um, but cozying up to Lucas and um, you know kind of lining themselves up so of like hey you know Lucas George if you uh, if you ever want to sell this, you know we got we got money. We can we can maybe throw four billion dollars your way and then get it going. And now we're getting a Star Wars land in a in a Disney park, and and we're getting a assembly line of of Star Wars films, and they're just cranking them out. 
And my thing is, I don't like the fact that so much of my entertainment is purchased by, is, is owned by like five or six corporations. However, it's hard for me to bitch about it when Disney's been doing right by them so much. Um, Force Awakens, I thought was great. And um, Rogue One, while not one of my favorites, had a lot of, a lot of uh, forward thinking decisions. I thought it, I think that they have a, an interesting plan lined up for the future of the franchise. And I'm I'm definitely optimistic about what what's you know what's going to happen in the next few years as far as Star Wars is concerned. We have the Han Solo spinoff, of course. I really want a, an Obi Wan one. I think Ewan McGregor also really wants an Obi Wan one, and I'd love to see that happen. So I'm excited to see what's coming next. And I'm not one of those people who's like fuck Disney. This doesn't count. Let's look who's in charge. And I don't know who those people are because those are probably the same people that didn't like the prequels. But there you have it. As far as my ranking of the Star Wars films, even the bad ones, I still love them in some ways, though begrudgingly. So let's just go through these. And this is I'm only ranking the eight live action films, not counting the animated one, because let's face it, that is basically a pilot for the television show that was released in theaters uh, to, I guess, maximize profit. And it wasn't released by Fox. It was, uh, I believe, a Warner Brothers joint uh, so I do not really consider that a Star Wars film. So coming in at number eight, The Phantom Menace, I already talked about. I have a lot of issues with that. Feels like a lot of political crap that I don't care about. And um, Jake Lloyd's performance is kind of grating. And Jar Jar Binks is also, as you may have heard over the last 20 years or so, uh, I do like... Um, some elements of it, some of the performances are fine. And like I said, it works as a prologue to the main story. But yeah, overall, it's one of those films that I can't really watch. I can't really watch objectively because if I watch it objectively, it's it's kind of a piece of shit. But as a Star Wars fan, I, I, I appreciate it as part of... I sort of accept it as part of the Star Wars saga in the way that you... You know, if you have a cousin that you really don't like, but you see him at Thanksgiving every every year, you're just like, yeah, all right. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> but you might not go out of your way to like, hey, man, let's hang out. Let's hang out. You, how long are you in town for? Let's go. Let's go. Uh, let's go get grab coffee. But you'll see him there, and you'll have a cordial conversation, and then you'll go about your way. That's sort of how I feel about Phantom Menace. It's the black sheep of the Star Wars saga for sure. Number seven, Attack of the Clones. I already said I understand the romantic uh, subplot with Anakin and Padme. Yes, it sucks. Yes, the romantic dialogue is terrible, but that's not the whole movie. I feel like people focus so heavily on that part of it that uh, it really detracts from the rest of the more interesting stuff that is there. The Jango Fett stuff, the clone army stuff, the Obi-Wan. Uh, Obi-Wan's uh, the, the, the beginning part in Coruscant. Or where the the chase with uh, Zam Wessel, I can't believe I'm remembering these names. I haven't seen uh, episode two in a little bit. I need to actually fire these films up again. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of good stuff going on in there. Sort of the 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 percolation of the Death Star plans and what that means, and uh, Palpatine really taking hold. I think there's a lot of things in Attack of the Clones to enjoy. Yes, there's too much CG. Yes, the romance is terrible. But there's a lot of other fun moments and elements to that film that I don't think should be discounted so quickly. Number six, Rogue One, a Star Wars story, or Rogue One, that's it, as most people call it. Um, you can listen to a podcast of the past in the show notes. I don't remember exactly what episode it was, but I did talk about that. I enjoyed that film, but I was overall sort of underwhelmed by it. Uh, I've always been much more attracted to the Jedi and Sith light and dark dynamic rather than the more military side of the Galactic Civil War. So while I think it's cool that it tees up or and leads exactly right, like literally into the opening frames of A New Hope, I uh, I didn't, I don't really, I wasn't really attached to those characters very much. And yes, they all had only one really one one movie to do that in, but I fucking love Rey and Finn, and I'm really interested to see what happens for Kylo Ren, and I love Poe, and I love BB-8, and I don't give a crap about Jen Erso and these other people, and um, that's that's a failure on the part of the film. I think I think uh, the characters could have used 
much more development and then maybe I would have had a little bit of more emotional investment in you know what happens to them in the film um, that being said I do like that as I was saying with Disney's role in the franchise I do like that with Disney it's kind of taking over things that the franchise is sort of going out on a limb trying something new taking a new direction and I'm I'm totally I'm totally down for more risky uh, decisions like that Rogue One just wasn't one that was entirely for me but you know don't don't get me wrong I I will happily put it along those other films and rewatch it on occasion just not one I'm gonna be hitting up again and again and again number five return of the Jedi so I've already said about how Return of the Jedi, the Ewoks bring that film way down for me. There's other little things in it that I'm like goofy decisions with the Rancor's Keeper and a few other moments that I'm just like, wait, what? What? what what's happening? Why do I care about this? Um, ultimately, there's a lot of good things in that film as well, of course. Ian McDermott is the Emperor. That whole Act 3 confrontation with Vader and Luke uh, and Palpatine is really what what keeps this film from sinking even lower on the list for me of course there's some great moments in the film um but again most of them involve the Va uh, vader and uh and luke and or luke and, and leia and kind of the revelation of their family ties and and how that all works it um it, it's a satisfying end to the franchise but not as satisfying as it could have been given what came directly before it number four revenge of the sith i know I know this is controversial for some people, putting a prequel above a entry, an entry in the original trilogy. But for me, Revenge of the Sith is a much more satisfying film than Return of the Jedi. The way it ends hits me, it gives me a gut punch every time. Uh, I get a little bit of that from Return of the Jedi, but uh, with the Force Ghost, but the whole goofy, you know, Ewok partying and drumming on Stormtrooper helmets. Again, Ewoks really fucking cast a pale over that movie for me. But Revenge of the Sith, yes, he and Christian's performance has issues. I already mentioned that in my brief discussion of the prequels. But uh, Ian McDiarmid, again, his performance is amazing. Uh, Ewan McGregor's performance is amazing. The political allegory of that film and the dictatorship rising... And the sequences involving uh, Order 66 and Anakin sort of uh, storming the Jedi Temple, and uh, so, there's so much good. There's so much good stuff in that film. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that's goofy, and and General Grievous could have been a more imposing villain, and that kind of thing. But the way that film ends and ties everything right back to A New Hope is just so perfect. And I remember wondering before Revenge of the Sith came out. How the hell they were going to do all this in one film. Attack of the Clones ended. And uh, Anakin and Padme married. And the Clone Wars started. And like, okay, so Revenge of the Sith, they need to end the Clone Wars. He needs to turn to the dark side. Uh, the, the droids need to get into other people's hands. The kids need to be born. Padme, I guess, has to die. Uh, all this stuff has to go down. And Lucas, for the most part, handled almost all of those really well. The uh, Padme death by loss of will to live was is really lame and, and very egregious for me but there's enough enough other good things going on that i can sort of overlook that and just roll my eyes when that line comes and be like yeah okay whatever lucas that's what you say um so moving on to number three the force awakens yes it it is very much a t a based on the template of a new hope there's another death star there's an an older mentor who sort of uh is is killed by a guy named Ben or a guy named Ben is involved in it I guess in that confrontation and the other one the guy named Ben is the one who dies um, there is a loner living on a desert planet who wants uh, something more there's a, there's a lot of elements of the of of the original film in there and I'm I'm kind of I've kind of made peace with that JJ Abrams has said that he had to take a step back in order to look to move forward and i and i think that that logic sort of does hold water um lucas has said it many many times that his six films were sort of there's a sort of poetry in there and there's like repeating themes and that's why there's a lot of visual callbacks to other events and parallels between anakin's journey and luke's journey in the individual um pre uh, tr trilogies and I think The Force Awakens sort of 
ties right back into that. Uh, I think it had to to introduce new audiences to this franchise and sort of reset it and capture the same spirit of the original films, but also push it forward. I think that it makes sense to have that basically function as a quasi remake slash reboot of the franchise, but still maintaining that continuity. If that makes any sense, especially considering there's been story wise, a 30 something year gap since we visited this world um, it makes sense that, you know, in the Star Wars galaxy, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And that's something that they acknowledge in the film itself. Mas Kanata is like, oh, the dark side and the light, the battle against the dark side. I've seen it take many forms, the Sith, the Empire, and now the First Order. So it, it's it's basically a testament to the fight versus good and evil and the hero's journey. That sort of remains constant throughout and uh, and just loops back around in different ways and different forms. And this this time, of course, we have Rey at the center of it all. Whether she's Luke's daughter or Obi-Wan's granddaughter, Palpatine's daughter, whether she was willed by the Force, wherever the fuck she comes from, uh, she's now the, the current arbiter of lightness. Or so we think. We'll see what The Last Jedi has to say about that. Coming in at number two, A New Hope. If you thought this was going to be number one, you are wrong, because there's one more Star Wars film left. But of course, the film that started it all, I mean, what, what is there more to say about this one? Um, Darth Vader, one of the best film villains of all time. Um, Mark Hamill, Harrison Ford, and Carrie Fisher. May you rest in, may you rest in peace, the last of you. Um, I think they this was really lightning in a bottle here. What Luke... Lucas, rather. What he captured, and... Um, Yes, it, it repurposes a lot of uh, inspirations, but that's really, that's what art is. And the fact that he created something that you'd closely to the things he loved growing up, but has that, it has in its own right inspired decades of people to to become storytellers, to dream big, to, to use their imaginations and stuff. Um, I think, I think uh, you know, A New Hope really stands... It's really a testament to itself. Number one, The Empire Strikes Back. That should be no surprise whatsoever. This is number one. I think this is most people's favorite Star Wars movie. Um, I, I love me some Yoda. I love me some plot twists. And uh, no, I'm your father. Not Luke, I'm your father, as it's often misquoted. Uh, it's probably one of the most memorable of all time. The The film really delves into not only Luke uh not only, not only Luke's connection with Vader but his connection his inner darkness and battling with that his uh not his legacy but the legacy of the of the force what it means what the philosophy really has what it really uh entails in a much deeper way than a new hope really had time to I mean Luke, uh, Obi-Wan gave him Gave Luke a couple lessons, maybe like what a few hours of Force lessons. Like this is the Force. Close your eyes and let it uh, let the Force flow through you. And uh, I think Yoda really takes that to an another level. I love Frank Oz's voice work and of course the puppet, the puppeting, uh, puppeting, puppeteering, whatever the fuck it is. The puppet work and Yoda uh, is amazing. The music by John Williams. I can't believe I've gotten this far into the podcast and haven't mentioned that. The music is so perfect. We'll get to that in a second. I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of my favorite musical themes. Um, just Empire Strikes Back is basically a perfect movie. I think A New Hope is also essentially a perfect movie. But I think Empire Strikes Back is basically takes the elements of A New Hope and makes them better in every single way. Um, I talked to a couple weeks ago about Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 and how that film takes the elements of Guardians of the Galaxy and really fine-tunes them and really makes them into something more special. And I also mentioned how it seems pretty closely modeled after The Empire Strikes Back. And in, in that same way, I think um, Guardians and Empire Strikes Back both kind of, uh, both prove that their predecessor wasn't a fluke. That there is something special and real about these characters, about these worlds. And The Empire Strikes Back essentially is 
confirmed that this wasn't just a one-off film, that this is something that's going to stand the test of time. And I think considering we're talking about this on the 40th anniversary of the original film, I think, uh, I think that, you know, that's been, that's been pretty pr proven pretty true. As far as some other favorites, some of my favorite characters, uh, part, I mentioned Revenge of the Sith and I've talked about how much I love that a couple times. Part of why I love that is that my four favorite characters in the saga all do battle at one time. It's, I'm talking about Yoda and Palpatine. I'm talking about Obi-Wan and Vader. Yes, Vader, not Anakin. I know they're the same person, but at this point, he is Vader. Anakin, Anakin, uh, whiny little Anakin. But you said no, the biggest problem in this galaxy is that no one helps each other. Wizard, not that kid. Not Anakin. Vader. Vader and Obi-Wan and Yoda and Palpatine. Those are my four favorite characters because, as I mentioned, they represent the light and the dark side of the Force. And I think there is no one else in the films that represents the dark side like Palpatine. And there's no one in the films that represents the light side like Yoda. And seeing those conflicting, conflicting ideologies at play and... Uh, there's just something sort of elemental about pure evil and pure goodness. And I think that those two characters specifically really capture that. Plus, I really like Obi-Wan as played by Ewan McGregor. I think that he brings something really sort of a playfulness to the role that wasn't as present in Alec Guinness's portrayal. Um, I mean, it was there, there was hints of it, but it wasn't, it wasn't as, as embraced. And that's why I've been really pushing every time i hear a story about you mcgregor possibly doing an obi-wan movie i just keep I, every i read it even though i know there's not going to be much of an update other than like he's he's waiting for a phone call oh, hopefully it'll happen but i, I really want to see that because i think there's such an opportunity there to take that character who's been sort of not on the sidelines but he's never really been the focus of a story aside from maybe attack of the clones where he, he propelled the mystery side of the, the clone army and all of that. I think there's a nice time gap where we can explore Obi-Wan sort of in between the two trilogies. As long as he ends up back on Tatooine by the time his story's over and is ready to save Luke when he gets caught up in the Sand People, I think uh, I think there's something there's some good stories to be told there. Favorite musical themes. Of course, the main theme. Gotta love that. Uh, the Imperial March, but my per my probably personal favorite is Princess Leia's theme. There's always some there's something very haunting, uh, not haunting, but sort of gentle and and beautiful about that piece of music. Um, I think John Williams scores for all seven of the episodic films is really outstanding. Uh, even even Force Awakens, even Phantom Menace. Even films that you wouldn't or that aren't as strongly known for their scores, I know Force Awakens is often um, maybe discounted a little bit as far as the music. I think people like Ray's theme, but that's about it. I think the track Star Killer Bass is really is really powerful and stirring and really makes that scene work in that film. Um, of course, I love Yoda's theme. There's just so much. The music of Star Wars is 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 a gift that keeps on giving, and it's one of those. I have a whole playlist of just all the Star Wars scores. So it's one of those things that's that's perfect to listen to while I'm writing or if I'm just chilling out. It's just, it helps me mellow out or it helps me want to pull my lightsaber out. Not and That's not a metaphor for something sexy. Pull the, the toy lightsaber that I have in the closet and it's not a, a sexy toy. The plastic light... Jesus, this is like a rabbit hole of, of problems. But it, it either fires you up, Duel of the Fates style, Battle of the Heroes style, or... It really mellows you out and helps you get in tune with what makes that franchise so uh, so much fun and why so many of us hold it so close to their hearts. And I'm thinking specifically about Yoda's theme when I say that. Um, because as I said, Yoda represents the best of the Force and I think in many ways the best of the franchise. And there's, there's a reason that the, the um, entry in the series that he plays the biggest role in is people's favorites as far as the lightsaber battles my favorite one is probably man i want to say episode three revenge of the sith but i think that hasn't aged very well just because 
of the overabundance of CG. I know that was in the prequels. That was one of people's big complaints is that Lucas just falls in love with CG so much. And I understand that's a valid concern. But um, that one's really fun. And I liked the Force Awakens one, even though it was sort of limited. Ray was still just kind of learning uh, learning to use the, the lightsaber for the first time. I mean, she didn't hold it until, spoilers, until like the final, what, 10, 15 minutes of the film. But that was that was probably one of my, one of the most powerful movie moments for me in the last few years is Ray catching that saber. And for that reason, it's it's particularly memorable. But if we're just talking about pure choreography and like visceral thrill, man, it might have to go back to episode one, Phantom Menace. Or one of the Vader matchups. It's, it's hard to say. This this is one of those things that it's like, pick your favorite child. The other one will all the other ones will all die. I'm like, um, uh, uh, all of you, I love all of you equally. Um But uh but yeah, I'd say episode one and then Fuck it. Episode 5, Empire Strikes Back, Luke versus Vader. Let's go with those two as my, my two favorites. So that's it for now. Uh, if there's anything Star Wars I didn't cover, feel free to reach out. I'm always down to talk about the franchise, obviously. Uh, I could easily stand here and just yammer on about Star Wars for no particular reason for another couple hours. But uh, I'll spare you all that. I hope this episode gave you a little bit more insight into my thoughts about Star Wars and sort of where I'm coming from as, from, as far as the franchise is concerned, what they've done, what, what connects to me, uh, how I feel about where it's gone and where it's headed. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see what you guys have to think, uh, have to say, rather, have to think. You, can ha- you have to think. You have to think about Star Wars. Right now, that's your assignment. You have to think about it. No, you, what you have to say about Star Wars and uh, you know feel free to reach out to me if you enjoyed this episode please rate and review us on iTunes if you'd be so kind also you can find us Crooked Table Podcast on Stitcher I'm at Crooked Table on Twitter you can find me on Facebook uh, or the podcast and Crooked Table on Facebook other social medias find more podcasts reviews uh, videos and other movie related goodies at CrookedTable.com Next week, we're going to be setting sail with Captain Jack Sparrow for a fifth, fifth, seriously, think, think about this, fifth, there's five now, that's a lot, that's a lot of movies, that's a lot of pirates, um, in Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales, which is I, I, a long and cumbersome title that I wish they had streamlined at some point, but you know, whatever, who knows, maybe I'll even whip out my mediocre impression of that Johnny Depp character, Savvy? That wasn't it. That was just me saying one of the words he does. Plus, we'll look back at either Johnny Depp, Johnny Depp's roles, or uh, other Disney films based on theme park rides. I haven't decided exactly what we're going to do, but it's probably going to be a Let's Talk About Six. Um, but, you know, until then, I've been Rob. We'll catch you around the table next week. And roll credits. This has been a production of CrookedTable.com. All rights reserved. That's the yard of a little KED.